Uh, welcome everyone to our first uh, virtual mini conference of the mini conference. Um, uh, we've decided to merge two seminars um, and kind of merge them under the same uh, theme, uh, which is in this case climate risk. So we will have uh, two speakers, um, Frank Diebold from University of Pennsylvania and um, Lars Peter Hansen from University of Chicago and two corresponding discussants, um, Eric um, Hillebrand from Oros University and Eric Renault from University of Warwick. Um, the format of the, each seminar is the same, so we'll have 45 minutes for uh, each talk, followed by 15 minutes of discussion. And the whole event is recorded as well. Uh, we still have our Q&A box, so if you, um, for all the people in the audience, feel free to drop your questions there, and I will be trying um, time permitting, I will try to relay these questions um, to the speakers. With that, um, let's let's begin. Our first speaker is Frank Dibault, uh, and the corresponding discussant will be Eric uh, Hillebrand. Frank, if you'd like to share your slides. Sure. Great. Yes. Is that looking all right? Yes. Looks all great. right, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's just a pleasure always to do anything with Sophie, and, and this is certainly no exception. So, um, you know, as I said a second ago to someone, I'm quite certain that each of the speakers and each of the discussions could speak for two hours each if given the time. So I'm, I'm feeling, you know, acutely aware of, of the 45 minute constraint. So let me jump right in. So the immediate title of these slides, when will Arctic sea ice disappear, projections of area extent, thickness, and volume, refers to one paper that's in a trio. And I want to kind of keep this talk fun and keep it at a sort of a high level, not a 35,000 foot high level, but, but you know, a fairly high level. And to do that, uh, I definitely want to give some context as well, because again, this is the middle paper in a trio. So we'll come to that in just a second. But first of all, just to, to get our feet wet for three minutes, you know, make sure we're all on the same page. A lot of people here might not be doing climate, might not be climate experts. You know, I'm not a climate expert. I'm not sure what a climate expert really even is. Um, but without a doubt, um, climate is a defining issue, maybe the defining issue of our times. And Glenn and I and various other co-authors uh, are working to bring econometric tools of various sorts to bear on climate sorts of problems. When you think about it, of course, econometricians are really quite experts over the decades and even over the centuries in aspects of trend and seasonality and regime switching and volatility and long memory and structural change and so forth. Uh, and more generally, we're experts in stochastic modeling, which sounds trivial and obvious. How else would you do your modeling? But the climate community often does things quite differently. So, um, you know, that's an interesting arbitrage, perhaps. And, uh, you know, you could say, well, uh, it's a steep arbitrage, fine. Uh, more generally, it's just really important. That's what excites us. So, you know, a lot happening. Here's the Oxford uh, Climate Econometric Group page. Here's the Climate Impact Lab page, which is sort of blending Chicago and Berkeley and Rutgers and others. Here's a special journal issue uh, focusing on climate change. And of course, there are many. Here's a leading seminar devoted to climate change. You know, here we are today uh, at Sophie thinking about this. So here's kind of one of these circular flow diagrams. Um, you know, every, the first page of any climate discussion always is like this, right? The economy produces greenhouse gases uh, with warm things. Um, and, you know, that side is all about mitigation, you know, how can we produce fewer greenhouse gases or get to net zero, but then it feeds back as well. The climate, uh, as it warms, causes damages of various sorts, and that's kind of the adaptation side, you know, how can we adapt to that, uh, and how big are the damages uh, in terms of agricultural productivity, labor productivity, health issues, migration, etc. Um, so, so fine. Um, but there's another loop, okay? We just looked at this, the big standard loop, but there's another loop having to do with the Arctic, and that's where we've decided to focus. We're thinking about different issues, some directly in the Arctic, uh, some not, but we decided to get our feet wet by looking at the Arctic. Now, why might one want to do that? Well, 
the Arctic is warming two to three times as quickly as the rest of the planet. And that has implications not only for the Arctic, but for the entire rest of the planet um, as atmosphere and ocean temperatures uh, rise in large part due to contributions from the Arctic. And that causes land ice to melt and hence the sea levels to rise and so on. So um, you've got this kind of feedback mechanism in the Arctic that makes it warm more quickly. Um, what happens, of course, is that ice roughly is white, uh, but as it melts, it turns into open sea, which roughly is black and retains a lot more heat. But then it's retaining that heat, so the ice melts even more, and so on and so on. So you've got the big loop that we started with here, but sort of inside it, you've got this really fascinating uh, sort of inner loop uh, with the Arctic. And that's why you see so much attention to the Arctic and Arctic sea ice um, in particular. So let's think a, a little bit about costs and benefits of Arctic sea ice melting. Um, I couldn't I couldn't maybe say this, but in a moment of trepidation before giving this talk, I thought to myself, well, uh, apart from the fact that there's sort of no finance and no econometrics in this talk, it, it's perfect for the society for financial econometrics. <laughs> so what do I mean by that? Well, there is a lot of finance and there is a lot of economics, but it's in the background. You know, Glenn and I and co-authors wanted to get our feet wet and learn about, there's a lot to learn, obviously, in terms of geophysical aspects of climate in general, but the Arctic in particular. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot in the background, which I'll mention in just a second. Um, and then on the econometric side, of course, there's tons of econometrics, but it's not designed to impress my econometrician friends. This is the sort of thing that undergraduates can do, you'll see. Um, but having said that, you, when you put it all together, we think we're on to some really, really interesting stuff, and hopefully I can convince you of that. So in terms of costs and benefits of warming, well, let's start with some costs, of course, increased emissions and hence increased warming. Um, um, you know, as, as um, you know, shipping and tourism and fishing, et cetera, ha starts happening more and more all over the Arctic, uh, you're going to have increased emissions and hence increased warming. That's also going to lead potentially, uh, not just potentially, but surely to uh, increased particulate p pollution, uh, discharges, foot deposits, maybe spill, you know, so there's, there's lots of environmental consequences on the negative side. On the other side, on, possibly on the upside, it depends on how you look at it, uh, but, you know, newly accessible deposits of uh, natural gas, petroleum, and other fossil fuels. You might say, oh my God, that, that's a benefit, but it depends who you are and how you're thinking about this. Um, but perhaps most importantly, the emergence of transarctic shipping lanes uh, is actually a really big deal. Uh, for example, kind of the, uh, the, the standard example is like um, Rotterdam to Tokyo. The shipping time as you go transarctic rather than down through the Suez Canal and around, it's going to be cut in half. The cost is going to be cut in half. That's a big deal for global trade, and global trade is, is a big deal, obviously. Uh, not only will the shipping time be less, but it'll be deeper in terms of less piracy. But when, when you have to go through the Suez Canal and down the Red Sea and so forth, you go through a lot of choke points where pirates can hang out and, and, and get you. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. But you can see, you know, lurking in the background here of the Arctic is all sorts of fascinating economic and geopolitical aspects, who controls the sea lanes, what is a sea lane, et cetera. Mm. So some questions, how, how quickly and with what pattern is Arctic sea ice decreasing? When will the Arctic first be ice free? And what does that actually mean? What kind of concept of ice free do we want? Um, how do econometric kind of reduced form statistical econometric um, projections compare to structural climate model projections? Um, and more constructively or, or constructively, uh, how can econometric, reduced form econometric methods potentially complement and enhance uh, structural climate science? So those are the sorts of things on the econometric side that we have in mind. And again, the underlying economic issues are the things having to do with global trade and the Arctic economy and so on. So here's the trilogy of papers that I was mentioning. So Glenn and I did a, a first paper. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because it's necessary to just see what's going on. They all hang together. Okay, uh, listed there as number one. You can read the, the title for yourself. So we'll, we'll talk about that for a few minutes. But then I'm going to emphasize paper two. Uh, paper one published already. Paper two, of course, is not. Um, where we 
do a lot of things. Paper one is sort of comparing reduced form econometric and structural climate science models in certain ways, okay? Paper two that I'm gonna emphasize more today is all about drilling down much more deeply on the non-structural econometric side, although we do get structural in certain ways in terms of key uh, climate science covariates being brought in. Um, but really we're gonna be banging on things in a lot of ways and checking robustness and extending things in various ways, and, you know, you'll see. But it's mostly what you would call non-structural, this paper two. And then paper three returns to the more structural side. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna see again throughout, we're gonna see divergences between structural climate science model projections and our statistical uh, econometric reduced form projections, no matter how we bang on things. So paper three is basically gonna say, why is that? What's, what's wrong in some sense with the, the climate model? Where, where and why are they going astray? All right. So here's a little bit of an overview of the first paper just to set the stage and show you how stark the, the results are here. Um, so, um, you know, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, in this paper, oh, the, the, the sample period differs slightly across papers. The ice concept differs slightly across papers. The modeling strategies differ slightly across papers. Uh, you'll see, I'll tell you more as we go, but that's all good. I mean, again, we're banging on this in various ways. One way is that the papers were written sequentially. So, you know, of course, time goes on as you go through them and samples change and all that. But again, the results are, are, are very robust. So anyway, in this paper, we've got monthly data, um, monthly uh, CI extent. We'll define that formally in a second if you don't know what it is. Uh, for the whole satellite era, which starts at the end of 78 and goes to the present. At the time this paper was written, the present was roughly the end of 2019. Um, we thought in what we think is an interesting modeling concept, we call it satellite, just like shadow interest rates in a, in a totally different literature. Uh, but what, what, it, what, what it is is sort of an index of the thermal state of the Arctic. Um, and you know, when, when the sea ice is positive, that is the index and you get to see it. When it goes negative, you don't get to see it. So there's like a censoring going on. Um, and here, this is involving CMIP-5, that's the coupled model in a comparison project. Um, the, the leading you know, model comparison consortium, uh, we're up to CMIP-6 now, and, and the later papers that I'll show you use CMIP-6 data. Uh, we're gonna be looking at a variety of emission paths, uh, so-called RCP 4.5, 6.0, 8.5, that, that would be ranging from low moderate to very high emission path, you know, depending on what happens. Um, okay, uh, when we get to the structural climate model uh, in, in just a second. So uh, to an extent, you know, the satellite records uh, brightness and from that uh, algorithmically a concentration, an ice concentration is determined grid by grid on a, on a network, a, a big, you know, on a big grid. Uh, if measured concentration is less than 15%, you call it zero. If it's above 15%, you call it one, as you can see there. Uh, that's very crude for some purposes, very useful for other purposes. We could talk a lot about it, but it is by far and away uh, one of the sea uh, life measures. It's sort of like GDP and macro. I mean, this is not anything uh, exotic. Uh, this is very central. So if you look at the ice extent here, it is plotted over time. Of course, it's seasonal. I see it's maximum uh, always in March, uh, and it's minimum always in September. March is blue, September is red there. Uh, you can see a trend to the whole thing, like a linear trend fitted there, but that's doing a lot of damage, really. The trends differ uh, month by month, and, and they're also not linear, as it turns out. So um, here's the satellite model. So the way it, all of this is, it says, well, look, um, there's this thing, shadow eye, it's called SIE star. And, you know, it, 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 in this setup, it's just a pure polynomial quadratic uh, trend. Turns out you need the quadratic terms. You just look in the paper for the details, and there are a lot of details. But, you know, shadow eye is evolving. Just, just the trend, your trend model here, the disturbance turns out to be a little bit clearly correlated. Uh, but that's really all you need. But then you don't get to see uh, shadow ice, shadow sea ice extent. Um, you see it when it's when it's positive, right? And you see a zero otherwise. So it can just plunge below zero, and it goes way below zero. That's saying that the thermal state of the Arctic is going way up. 
so so that even if it got a lot colder, it'd still take a while for ice to form again, you know, that kind of stuff. This is the debt, okay? Um, th again, there's a lot more in the paper, of course, but uh, again, I'm gonna keep this at a high level. Um, so here we've got September sea ice extent. The black is history uh, at the time this paper was written. The red, uh, it, you know, inside the black is, is the in-sample fit uh, to a quadratic polynomial. And, and outside uh, the sample, you have the extrapolation of the polynomial. Uh, we've also got confidence bands here. That's another thing. Across the papers, we do the confidence bands in a lot of different ways. These are done with, uh, you know, a Johnson-style um, assumption uh, with deterministic regressors, which is right here. We've just got polynomial trends, uh, assuming Gaussian stocks, which is actually quite accurate, believe it or not, uh, here. In other papers, they're done with bootstrap, sometimes parametric bootstrap, sometimes non-parametric bootstrap. So there's a lot, and things are very robust with respect to the intervals as well. Now you should be skeptical of any interval that you ever see by anyone in this literature, right? When you think what's going on in climate and the geophysics that we don't understand, and then also the human behavior that that's just not not clear. I mean, you know, you should be skeptical. Um, in fact, you know, Lars might even say, I don't want to put any words in his mouth, but you, you might even say that it's, it's not obvious that this is even risk. You know, it might be more nightly and uncertainty. Um, but, you know, so, so be skeptical of confidence intervals, but at any rate, I'd rather have them than not have them. But you see how quickly, um, you know, the ice is projected to decay by the early 2040s here. Um, you know, uh, shadow ice is project, projected to cut through zero. Here, now, superimposed on that same picture are the climate model projections. So these are the average projections, okay, across 30-some CMIT-5 uh, climate models under the four emission scenarios, okay, uh, medium, medium heavy, and, me and heavy. And you can see that no matter what you do, they're just decaying much, much more slowly, kind of end of the century. A lot of people, myself included, would say, well, zero ice is not interesting. It may never get to zero. People talk about a near ice-free Arctic, which is much more compelling. Usually people use a million square kilometers. And, but you can see, you know, we're projecting that to happen around 2040. Uh, the others, depending on the severity of the emissions assumed, are much, much later. And, and um, you know, it's just a wild diversion. The way stimulus five works is these take off a little earlier than our, our forecast does, but even if we restrict our sample so that it ends here in about 2010, you get the same projection for us. And again, you get the much slower projections there. All right. If you convert this into um, you know, densities, you know, our model is a stochastic model, we can convert um, into densities. And you can see like uh, September sea ice of a million square kilometers, that's the near ice free Arctic. You see, as I said, the mode is around 2040. Um, if, if you use a more lenient standard, you can get a mode even around 2030. If you insist on zero, you know, it goes up to 2045. If you, if summer sea ice, the summer in the Arctic is August, September, October. That's harder to do three months in a row than just any one month. So that, that happens. Uh, with a mode around 2050. Of course, there's a lot of stochastic variation possible around that. But you see, but here's what the climate model average gives you under the most severe emission scenario, just really bad emissions. Uh, it's just nowhere near. You know, it's in the 2060s or 2070s. So you, you get this big divergence. Okay. So in um, in the second paper. Um, what we do then is sort of bang on this in various ways. We, we, we retreat from the structural climate models and say, well, let's, let's see if we can be co totally confident and how we can improve upon, you know, our reduced form uh, econometric model. So we're going to do a lot of things. Um, yeah. they're, they're linked to um, in what I would call increasing the information set for these projections. So instead of looking at just the ice extent, we're going to look at area extent thickness and volume, okay? Instead of just having a, a fake covariate, like a quadratic, you know, linear and quadratic time trend term, we're gonna bring in a the, the obvious science covariate, uh, namely carbon, uh, whether measured as emissions in gigatons 
or as atmospheric concentration. It can be totally robust to that. All these things are going to be robust. We're going to consider different constraints, um, at least in principle, if we could measure without error things like the ice area, thickness, and volume, right? When any one is zero, they all must be zero, right? <laughs> if, if area is zero, there's no ice, so thickness has to be zero, volume has to be zero as well, and so on. So we're going to work with multivariate models. That's another extension. Instead of univariate, we're going to go multivariate, and we're going to think about imposing um, some geophysical constraints to make sense. Uh, we're also going to move from CMIP 5 to CMIP 6, which, um, you know, exists now uh, when this paper is written. So uh, area, to go from, you already know extent is, um, what extent is, uh, we already defined that. Um, you take concentration and round it down to zero if it's less than 16% or up to one if it's bigger. Area just doesn't do that round. And you always round down to zero. If concentration is less than 16%, you just call it zero. But, but area just leaves it, you know, concentration 65%, then you just say the area of ice is 65% of the grid. Uh, and then you add up across all the grids. Uh, and these are direct measurements from satellites, again, in the satellite era of post-78, which is what we're using. Thickness and volume come from, uh, they're so-called reprocess data. They're partly based on satellite measurements, but they also involve a, a certain model that fits. That's why they're called reprocess. The model here is the industry standard biomass, panarctic ocean modeling, and assimilation system, if you're into this. So let's think about the key science covariate carbon, right? Here's just a plot with some fitted linear regression of um, um, grain. So how late do we go? We go to like 1135 or uh, 45, right? Uh, yes. Yes, yeah, that's so oh, wonderful. For some reason, I'm thinking I only had to 11:30, um, uh, which is great. Um, so, um, okay. So, here they have thought it out. Of course, the pen is what everybody focuses on because, again, sea ice is uh, uh, it's, it's minimum every September, and you know when is the Arctic going to be ice free or nearly ice free? That's that's a big question. So, it's really all about September ice. And if you, if you think about our satellite model here, let me just pop back to it. You see it's a quadratic time frame model, but with dummies for each month. So it's really like 12 different quadratic time frames, one for each month. The only thing is that they're unified by the little uh, AR1 disturbing, you know. So if, if, if August has unusually much ice, well, then September is likely to as well. But other than that little bit of month to month zero correlation, it's just like 12 separate quadratic friends. So really what we wind up doing in the next paper here and what most people do is just to say, uh, well, let's just pull out all the September. Uh, and so that's what I've plotted here, okay? September Arctic sea ice, uh, again, um, cumulative um, CO2 emissions and gigatons. Um, you get the exact same picture if I were to look at atmospheric concentration, which will come actually a little later, but, um, if you care, I, I also put Mars, again, remarkably linear and tight fit. If you care about the whole annual average, here it is, also super tight, because it's an average, you know, so you reduce the variance a bit. But it's really quite remarkable how linear this is. People talk about this in the geophysical climate literature. It's not completely understood why it's linear, but uh, it's really quite remarkable, right? And you might say, well, wait a minute. A second ago, you were telling us about quadratic trend. Now, what, what do you mean? Now you're talking about linear. Well, this is a linear in carbon in emissions. Okay? Before, we were just looking at polynomial trends, you know, time, just time, like business as usual kinds of things. And when you think about it, and I'll show you this, these linear trends are possibly completely coherent with the nonlinear quadratic time trends I showed you earlier. Why? Because carbon has been, at least historically, increasing at an increasing rate. Right, which means the Arctic, the temperature has been increasing at an increasing rate, which means the ice is, is going to be dropping at an increasing rate. And that's what we found in time just a second ago. So at least potentially, and you'll see in practice, it is definitely true. These linear trends in carbon are completely consistent with the nonlinear time trend that I was showing you a second ago. So let's go to get to that. Let's go by variate though. And what we do here, we always, we're in, in this paper, we, we're kind of mostly interested in area. We, we switch from extent to area, 
no big reason that people look at both. And um, you know, again, we're going to be looking at area extent, thickness, and volume, but we're going to anchor things on area. And we're going to say, well, what if we blend the area with extent? What if we blend the area with thickness? What if we blend the area with volume? You know, so we're going to look at bivariate model. Okay, so it's always area here in the middle, uh, but blend it with some other variable x where X might be extent, thickness, or volume. And then we're going to impose the constraint, though, that at least in principle, when, when any one hits zero, the, others, the other has to hit zero as well. So, um, so we're going to impose that on the bivariate system, um, which, of course, we couldn't impose on a, on a univariate system. You can see sometimes that matters, sometimes it doesn't. You know, here, for example, our area and extent, you see an unrestricted bivariate fit there in the upper left. They're not. Uh, you know, achieving um, uh, zero ice uh, or near ice free at anything like the same time. When we impose the constraint, of course, by construction, they do, but it changes the fit a little bit, changes the slope to the fit. Uh, other things like here's area and thickness, it happens that without imposing the constraint there, they're, they're still hitting zero at about the same time anyway. So imposing it doesn't change anything. So it, it depends on what you're looking at. But, um, you know, it can matter, and it often does. Here are the uh, so-called SSP uh, scenarios. Um, you know, a, a high and a, and a medium and a low, if you will. Or you might say a very high and a medium and a medium low, but whatever. Standard scenarios that, that people look at. Uh, don't worry about these dashed lines right now. I'll come back to them uh, maybe a bit later. But, you know, these are the standard scenarios that people use Think about warming. Like, what if what if emissions as we go through the century or out to 2065, say, follow this bottom path or the middle path or the top high emissions path, um, that sort of thing. Well, you notice what we get from the carbon models, the carbon trend models here, right? We 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 can see what um, cumulative emissions are uh, at zero ice, which means we can then go through a, a, a figure like this. Go over here on the left and um, see, you know, wherever we need to go for, for emissions at zero ice, go over um, to the SSP curve and then go down to the year. You know, so we just run, we can just run the, the emissions at, at zero ice through the inverse of whatever SSP scenario we, we want and read off the corresponding year in terms of when is that going to happen. Okay. And, you know, if you do that, in other words, if we take these linear carbon trends, you know, these kind of linear things, very clearly linear, uh, and run them through the inverse FSP scenario here, we can infer the corresponding time trend. And you see they look exactly like the kinds of things we got when we fit quadratics directly to um, sea ice in the earlier case extent, um, but to sea ice uh, in time. And again, we can do that, um, you know, in the constrained world or, or the unconstrained world, like here, or imposing um, the um, equal timing constraint here, uh, or again, down here, it doesn't matter much. But again, what do you see? We've done things very differently now. It's not a quadratic time frame or anything like that. We, we brought in carbon. And if I were to show you atmospheric concentration, it's exactly the same sorts of results. We've been looking at emissions, uh, cumulative emissions. But you see, any way you slice it, um, the point forecast uh, for hitting zero uh, is it depends on what bivariate model you're doing, but it's, it's like somewhere around 2040, 2045, and even be in the 20, 2030s actually. And you'll see in a second that that it is in some leading cases. Um, so, um, all right. So I just sort of actually did this slide without realizing it. Um, but yeah, so so here's like um, here's here's another one of these comparisons. Okay, here's a linear carbon trend in ice ice time. Uh, right. Okay, so this is a different issue. So what we've done so far today is uh, I fit these linear carbon trend and then I converted them to quadratic. Um, you know, I figured out the implied uh, nonlinear uh, time frame. Um, we were just looking at that, and they match very closely. Alternatively, you know, in the previous paper, right, we just, we just, we, we didn't figure out a quadratic time frame by inverting an SSP or anything like that. We just fit them directly to the data. And that's what we get here in this case of area and thickness. So you see, no matter how you slice it, 
uh, these things all cohere very closely. Um, um, you know, this thing on the right, this picture on the right is basically the, the first paper. It's sort of a summary in some sense of the first paper. This, this, this thing on the left here is sort of the second paper. It's what you get when you invert uh, a linear carbon strand by running it through the, the inverse um, SSP um, or one of the inverse uh, SSP scenario, the medium emission scenario. And as it says there, they're virtually indistinguishable. Um, here, if you look at a, if you try to, you know, again, we can stochastically simulate uh, things and look at different interesting, um, you know, percentile and so on. Um, and, you know, so, so this is um, leaf for NEPA, a near ice free Arctic, meaning uh, when are you going to, when do you hit a million square kilometers? And you can see, um, of course, if you use a, a, a harsher uh, emission scenario like 7.0, um, you, you tend to hit sooner compared to like 4.5, for example. But you can see the median here, you know, it depends on which bivariate model you're looking at, but, you know, 2036, 33, or even 25. Volume has some issues. Uh, do I think if we're really going to hit near ice free Arctic in 2025? Of course not. Uh, but uh, so I won't say anything more about that now. But you see under the under the um, Bentler emission scenario, you hit near ice free Arctic a little bit later, but only a little bit later. Here's what you get when you directly fit a time span, like in the first paper. They're all cohering. Let's call it mid, mid 2030. And if you see, if you go all the way to the right hand side of the distribution, let's say like the 80th percentile, maybe I'll even, if I can get it on my screen, yeah, uh, I'll go all the way to the 95th. You can see that the 95th percentile under the hard emissions is, is, is um, 2038. It only goes up to 2040 under the denser emissions. And again, it's, it's also 2040 when we fit directly as in the first paper. So, you know, you have to work really hard um, to get, you know, even the 95th percentile. Of these distributions to be, you know, anything like above 2045, uh, let's say. So, um, so what do we conclude from this middle paper? Um, oh, this is great. Uh, so, there's going to be time. I'm going to tell you a little bit of the last paper, and we can have some Q and A and stuff like that. Um, so, um, right. So, both linear carbon trend and quadratic time trend models. In other words, kind of the second paper or the first paper predict rapid Arctic sea ice, sea ice decline along nearly identical paths with September NEPA near ice free Arctic arriving in the late 2030s. And again, you see all the, the sample periods, the ice concept, the CMIP 5 versus CMIP 6, the modeling, you know, are we bringing in carbon or not bringing in carbon? No matter what we do, you know, it, it's always coming out, you know, late 2030s. And you know, if you saw in the structural models, the climate models we looked at at the beginning, they were more like 2070s um, with gentle landings rather than the, the hard landings that our shadow ice model facilitates, we think beneficially. Uh, so again, it, the same prediction is robust across lots of uh, constraints as well, the different timing constraints and so on. So this buttresses, look, this buttresses, I think, the early research, paper two, buttresses paper one, right? Um, we've now banged on the non-structural, uh, or let, uh, let's call it non-structural. I mean, we've got the carbon covariates and all that, uh, but it's not a deeply structural, um, you know, ocean atmosphere kind of model. Um, uh, and, and, and we feel even more confident than ever uh, in those projections. So it buttresses the early research. Um, and you know, it's going to facilitate new research, and I want to tell you a little bit about that right now, in the sense that, uh, you know, so, okay, it really does look like there's something going on in the climate model that makes them not, um, um, you know, get to zero ice uh, quickly enough. Now, there is a little sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't for this. When, you know, a year or two ago, when I first talked to climate people about this, uh, they would say, you're crazy. You know, there's no way in 2040. The models don't say, they say 2070. And I would say, well, yeah, I mean, the models may say that. Your models do, but, you know, uh, our models definitely don't. And um, and now I say that, to, I say, uh, you know, it's going to be 2040 or so. 
And they say, well, you know, of course, everybody knows that, you know, tell me something I don't know. Uh, so, <laughs> so things are changing. And I want to show you a bit how things are changing. Uh, but more generally, how, how this modeling may lead us to places where we can say constructed things, uh, or at least push things back a stage or two um, towards constructive things um, for the climate model. So that brings us then uh, to this part three and paper three, uh, illuminating model-based projection failures via the carbon sensitivity of sea ice. So again, in terms of this trio that I started with, um, you know, we talked about paper one, we've now talked about paper two, uh, and now I want to talk just, just very, very briefly uh, about paper three, more to sort of whet your appetite, um, but, you know, let me do that. So, um, so we're going to now return to this view of, well, let's actually think more again about comparing um, reduced form econometric models, which we've now explored much more thoroughly, to structural climate models. That's point one there. Let's go to point three. We're going to do it in the new CMIP 6 environment, which is the current best practice model, you know, circa 2024. Um, but we're going to see how they compare, those CMIP 6 compare, those CMIP 6 simulations compare to CMIP 5, which we've been looking at so far. Um, you know, CMIP 6 sort of came online a couple of years ago, something like that. Um, we're also going to consider individual climate model projections rather than multi-model mean. Before I was averaging across all the CMIP 5 models, if you recall. Now we're going to look model by model. We can also look at ensemble, right? And many of the models are simulated, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 times. And due to the intrinsic variation, even though they're not stochastic models, um, they've got intrinsic variation and, you know, they, they initialize them at different places. So the, the simulated paths from the deterministic differential equations are nevertheless different. So you get these ensembles. Um, so we're going to look at things in a little bit more detail. But we always want to look at them through this, this kind of carbon friend lens. Like how does sea ice area depend? We know it's linear. We don't, you know, the physical science doesn't know exactly why it's linear, but as an empirical approximation, it sure is. So far, um, there's no evidence of it breaking. Um, and we want to look at, you know, these key coefficients, alpha hat and beta hat, if you will. And of course, the really key coefficient is beta, you know. How sensitive is the ice area to carbon? Uh, and how sensitive is it in the data versus in the model, in the structural climate model? That's, that's sort of what we want to compare, right? And, you know, here's another picture. Like we already saw this one here on the left, um, the ice area against um, emissions, the same linear trend. It's just the same fixed figure copied over. Here, just, I've mentioned several times that things are identical if you do it in terms of atmospheric concentration. Well, here happens to be an atmospheric concentration version, but everything uh, is the same. In the first version of the second paper, we did it in emissions, then a referee wanted us to do it in terms of concentration, so we redid the whole thing. Uh, it was very tedious, but it was, it was worth it. Um, I feel very confident. Anyway. Um, let's stay with emissions, the left column of numbers here. Um, this is uh, what's true in the observed data, okay? So, um, you know, if you just go and fit um, a carbon trend, as we've discussed, you get an intercept that's about five and a slope that's about negative three. And you, you, actually, and, you know, the relationship is really remarkably clean. No evidence against linearity, no evidence against uh, Gaussianity. No evidence of structural pain. These are standard tests. Uh, given the time constraint, I, I won't dwell on them. But um, you know, the, the linear kind of thing really is remarkable. Um, now, now this is this is what's true in the data. Here's a graph of the data. Here's the regression summarizing the data. Um, this is what's true in terms of um, the first run. You know, a single run of each of the 37 CMIP5 models. Okay. So what's true in the data is red. All right, that's, that's what we're looking at here. The intercept is about five, the slope is about negative three, right? So here it is. The slope is about negative three, the intercept is about five. But any point here is one of the 37 CMIP5 models. And you can see they're not looking so close, are they? In particular, 
all the interceptors, the vast majority of the interceptors, too large. And, and more interestingly, perhaps, all the slopes uh, are too small in absolute value, right? You want something down around negative three, they tend to be down around negative two or negative 1.8. Um, like there, there's really nothing in this inside the red box there, right? Um, so you see that things are, are kind of really going off. Um, the models aren't sensitive enough to carbon, you know, sea ice area in the model uh, tends not to be sensitive enough to emissions. Um, and, and that's why as emissions go up, the models uh, don't predict sea ice area dropping enough. Of course, they predict it to drop, uh, but not enough uh, typically. Um, here's the same pictures for models, but now they're the 29 in the sixth model. And you see they look a little better, but they're still not looking great. Most of the models have, um, you know, still have a, a slope reflecting insufficient carbon sensitivity. And most of the models still have intercepts uh, that are too big as well, as well. Here are some individual models. So this happens to be, you know, TAN ESM2. That's a certain Canadian model, very famous, very distinguished. But and these are all at different runs. Uh, at, you know, so whole ensemble uh, for CMIP5, and then there are a lot more runs done uh, recently for CMIP6. Uh, and you see what's true in the data again. That's the same thing we've been looking at all along. The, the same red. But you can see the Canadian model happened to have an intercept. Intercepts are too small, actually, actually um, in, uh, in CMIP5. Uh, and slopes, in fact, were, were too small. They, they kind of overcompensated in CMIP6. The models got intercepts too big, and, and the slopes are, are maybe a little bit, a little bigger, too. You know? But you know, uh, the point is, um, CMIP5 doesn't look very good there. And you know, the thing you know, there's what's true. It's a different model. doesn't matter what it is. But you can see, as it went from 5, to fix um, uh, what happened to it. Uh, here's another model. If you go from CMIP five to six, it's, it's moving leftward, uh, but but still, um, well, it's not so bad. Actually, the data is not so bad. But you see, it's just a motley assortment of things. It all depends on the model, you know. It all depends on the model. Uh, some models, perhaps randomly, some or not randomly, but they they, they get a lot better. A few, uh, most don't. And the way in which they don't differ a lot over models, as you can see, when you just sort of look at uh, points like this, comparing the different model ensembles to the data in CMIP 5 versus 6. If you average across all the models, um, here it is, right? So this, if you look at the median beta hat uh, in the model, if you take every ensemble run of every model and you do it in CMIP 5 on the first line versus CMIP 6 on the second line here, uh, take the medium of that diversion between the model beta hat and the data beta hat, uh, it, it's, it's really no different in five or six. In fact, it's a little bit worse uh, in six. A big, the way it's set up, right? A bigger number means, uh, the bigger the number here is, it means the more carbon insensitivity you have. You know, so things are a little bit worse in terms of the model is not being sensitive enough in six versus five. Uh, certainly relative to those standard deviations, you might say, you know, there's really no change. Let's put it that way. Um, so that just to wrap up, it looks like we're 45 minutes in. Um, you know, I hope that putting these three papers together and doing it at a kind of, you know, mile high viewpoint was good. Um, you know, we could have gone the other way and taken a deep dive to, into any one paper. But you see how they fit together, and you how you see how they all are really different. The first first one does the preliminary models versus the data thing. The second paper then really dives much more deeply into the data, trying to get our handle on on things and crucially bringing in carbon uh, covariates. And then the third one goes back to comparing models to data, but through this lens of the carbon trend and and so-called um, carbon sensitivity, and and we sort of trace. The, uh, the weaknesses of the structural model to their being in, insufficiently sensitive um, to carbon movement. Um, so then uh, number five here, you know, the, the basic optimistic conclusion I think is that hopefully I've demonstrated some aspects in which the econometric models can com complement and help us to learn about the strengths as well as the weaknesses of structural climate models. 
Um, they can pack things up in the short run, kind of a, a buttress for theoretical weaknesses. Um, they can be a benchmark for climate model calibration, as we've seen in various ways. Uh, they can help us to think about climate model selection, kind of a filter for model selection, and um, an, an avenue for, for introducing probabilistic projections. Um, it's very easy through stochastic simulations. You can put easy in quotes. Again, you know, you have to take everything in climate um, skeptically. I mean, there's there's so much uncertainty. Um, but but again, econometricians do know uh, a lot about probabilistic projections, and I, I hope I've illustrated how our probabilistic thinking um, can can be helpful in that regard. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, there are currently no questions from the audience, so we can naturally move to the um, discussion. Eric, if you'd like to share your slides. Yes, sure. Frank, can you uh, unshare your slides? Oh, sorry. No worries. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Perfect. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on the program uh, and for inviting me to discuss these uh, interesting papers by uh, Frank and co-authors. Um, so just a, 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 a quickly one thing I want to highlight. This is really, I mean, with the, with Frank's forecast, he has he has skin in the game, right? Because I mean, by the end of the of two thousand thirty, we're going to see who's right, right? <laughs> so um, uh, obviously, I hope Frank is wrong, but he may just be right. Uh, so here are two comparisons to, uh, um, uh, to to what has been published in the IPCC report. So the middle uh, panel here is what the special report on uh, the ocean and the cryosphere in 2019 said. And this here is the picture from the latest assessment report 6 in 2021. And you can see that what, what Frank presented basically still holds, right? The, the, like the worst scenarios hit the, the near uh, ice-free Arctic line and then like 2075. I think this is very hard to see here on this scale. I think it has actually come up a bit, but, but not by a whole lot. So in this discussion, I want to uh, uh, focus on, on basically on two key aspects of, of the work that we've just seen. The one is the, the linearity of the sea ice and atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And the other is the, um, the question of a quadratic trend for sea ice. Um, and uh, then I have uh, also, uh, I'm going to make a brief remark about embedding this in a, a bigger carb carbon cycle system and some other few questions. So, um, so, so the, the, one of the cornerstones as we've seen in, in, in Frank's analysis is here, is this the, the linear relation of a sea ice extent area, thickness, volume, whatever uh, measure you want to use, and atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Where is this linearity coming from? Um, so the, the, a, a very common way in climate science to, well, maybe not model this, but at least conceptualize this, is to think about a, basically a system of ordinary differential equations where, where you look at some, some variables of, of matter and energy stores. So for example, here, it's the uh, the the stocks of sea ice and the stocks of uh, atmospheric carbon or cumulative uh, uh, emissions uh, was also another variable Frank looked at, and you have a um, uh, you have a forcing, which uh, uh, here is just CO two. We're just talking about carbon here, but you could imagine other greenhouse gases, aerosols, other things that somehow drive the climate. And then you have some potentially uh, nonlinear function that gives you this, the system response fluxes, how the system now uh, reacts to, to these forcings. And the, the cornerstone and, and, and or the, the way the, uh, these, these linearities are conceptualized is that, okay, so, so say you linearize this system response function. Then, of course, immediately the question arises, how good is this approximation? But if you are willing to, to, to look at such a linearization, well, well, then you are in a world where you have a system of linear ordinary differential equations, which, of course, 
uh, driven by some some time varying right hand side, which of course we understand very very well. So you get the you get the matrix exponential as the green function, and you can show um, that crucially you can show that uh, if you look at the the changes in the stocks, uh, the derivatives divided by the um, uh, by the instantaneous forcing, but also at the stocks themselves, not the changes, but the stocks themselves. So no prime here, and divided by cumulative forcing. So by that variable Frank was looking at, the cumulative CO2 emissions, for example, then you end up with a linear combination of the of the well, actually, of the coefficients and the eigenmodes, not the eigenmodes themselves. So the exponential actually goes out. This is an interesting paper that I can uh, recommend here, uh, Michael Raupack, 2013, the exponential eigenmodes of the carbon climate system. Uh, this is the reason why, if this linearization is any good, uh, you actually get these remarkable uh, linearities that we've just seen, CIs on um, uh, sea ice on CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, but also other very famous uh, uh, constants, such as, for example, the airborne fraction, the share of um, the share of the emissions that remains in the atmosphere, which is remarkable. Well, which is remarkably stationary if you look at it, but it has a lot of variance. It has a lot of variance. People say it is remarkably constant around 0.45, or I'm not so sure if I would under, uh, uh, subscribe to that, but it is clearly stationary. Um, so so this, is, uh, 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 this is one of the ways to conceptualize why this linearity is working. Now, again, where are the areas in climate science where people have found this linearity to to be of, of quality. This is, for example, in the, in the whole carbon cycle system, um, uh, the land and in particular, the land and ocean sinks that react uh, uh, surprisingly linear to atmospheric concentrations. And, and as a derivative of that, airborne fractions and sink rates are, are constant. Uh, in energy balance, this famous um, relation of warming to radiative forcing, which is uh, 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 remarkably constant. But now, as we just seen here, also sea ice and CO2 concentrations. Um, the, uh, the reason for this is that, of course, like, like always when you linearize such a, such a nonlinear system, uh, what you do is you linearize around a certain steady state. And, and this would here be the uh, pre-industrial equilibrium the climate was in before uh, the, in, in, in the 1750s or in the 18th century. Uh, before the uh, the acceleration in, in, in carbon emissions. And uh, uh, even though we have been emitting, uh, of course, substantially since then, uh, since the stock of atmospheric CO2 concentrations is, 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 is big, it's 900 gigatons of carbon in the, in the air, um, it is changing relatively slowly. And we have been, so to speak, close enough to this pre-industrial uh, equilibrium uh, that this uh, linear approximation was of sufficiently high quality. But uh, um, so this is essentially where, where the whole discussion about tipping points belongs, right? So tipping points you can think of as, um, uh, as, as, as phenomena that climate science has identified where they expect the nonlinearity as we move away from the pre-industrial equilibrium to manifest itself first. And some of them, are uh, uh, some of them are, are are material for Hollywood movies, and other of others are are much quieter and and no, uh, 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 but 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 nevertheless un, uh, nevertheless concerning. So one of those more quiet uh, questions about nonlinearities is precisely this uptake of um, of carbon by by the land and ocean. So the question is: there any saturation? Are the are the plants and the sea in some sense saturating and will in the not so distant future, the uptake of carbon uh, by the things be slower than linear. Um, 
Okay, so let's say that uh, we, we accept this for the time being, that the C is, is uh, reasonably approximated as a linear function of the uh, carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. I'm just writing them as C sub T, excuse me, the uh, 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 Frank's uh, 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 notation here was CO2C, but these are the atmospheric concentrations. So we have a linear function. Um, well, if you start from from like very much first principles, this is actually an exercise that I give my students in my in my math class. So if you think about the the the, the carbon system, uh, so we're, we're, so so we're asking now what are the dynamics that are going on here, right? If you if you accept this uh, this linear function, what are the dynamics of the of atmospheric concentrations? Well, you get the you get the the forcing minus the sinks activity. And the sinks activity by the same token is linear in concentrations. Uh, no, well, so now you get precise, no, now we're, now we're scalar. So you get precisely such a, a, a differential equation that we were just looking at here in a system perspective, only now it's just a scalar thing, right? So we just solve this by, by variation of constants. And what you get then is an uh, well, you, you you get this expression in the forcings, and now the the interesting question is, what is your model for the forcing? Well, one model that climate scientists like to like to use is that forcings are exponential, and they look when they say that they look at the CO two emissions uh, of the entire historical record, so from 1750 here to today. Well, that looks uh, maybe like something you would be willing to model with an exponential. Well, if you plug that in and you solve, then you get an exponential trend in, uh, in, in, in atmospheric concentrations, indicating that you should be using an exponential trend also in sea ice. Um, now, if you look, if you zoom in on the later part of the record, uh, so here in 1959 to 2021, well, it doesn't look so exponential, actually. So here you may be perfectly satisfied, maybe, with modeling with a linear trend. Now, if you plug that one in, you actually get a linear trend. So we're not seeing a quadratic trend. Well, or are we? Uh, so we need to talk a bit about this, this, this beta down here. Um, so uh, uh, bear with me. There are a few uh, but very short derivations here. That, but it's yeah, this basic time series analysis. We do, this, uh, we do this all the time. So if we say, now let's assume that the emissions are linear. So we write down a random walk with drift for um, for emissions. Uh, and now we're also adding a, a, a random disturbance. So we attack the whole thing now a bit more econometrically and go away from the differential equations. Uh, then, of course, since this is a random walk with drift, you get an I1 uh, a process for, for emissions. And again, looking at the later part of the record, you may be happy with that. Now, the sinks, as said, are linear in concentrations, uh, and the change in concentrations is given by way of the global carbon budget by emissions minus sinks. What does not go down into the sinks must stay up in the atmosphere. Um, so now the the, the linear uh, concentration, the linear sinks are are subtracted, and now. Crucially, importantly, if you look at what is actually this linear, uh, this linear response of the sinks to concentrations, it's a very, very small coefficient, highly significantly different from zero, but not big. So, okay, so you bring that, so this is a simultaneity, right? So, so you get CT here, you get CT there, you bring it all over to the left-hand side, uh, you divide through, what are you divide? You divide through. Okay, so you get a, 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 a you get something that is of the order here. So this is going to be your here's an I one, here's an I one. Here's your here's your second root. What's the second root looking like? 0. 0.98. Well, that's fairly close to a second unit root, but it is not a second unit root. It's just close to it. Right? Okay, so you find the solution for that. You see. Again, you get a linear trend. You don't get a quadratic trend. But what you have just divided through with is a near second unit root. So this is a very, very strong linear trend. And this thing here is a filter operating on an I1 with a near unit root. So you get 
Still in I1, but ranging on I2. All right, so now we see why it actually makes a whole lot of sense, in fact, to use a quadratic trend to, for CIs, even though we haven't seen it analytically here, because this is a very, very strong trend. So if you, you, know, if you divide uh, by one minus 0.98, you get 0 0.02. So this is a big trend. And this is the reason why if you look at the Keeling curve, this is the, 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 the time series of atmospheric concentrations, uh, you see something that where you can visually discern that it has some curvature. So just shown, Eric. yes. Uh, sorry, apologies for interrupting. Uh, you've got a couple minutes left. Yeah, I, uh, I have one minute left. Is that right? Couple of minutes, yes. Couple of minutes, even. Well, I'm going to land in one minute. Well, I hope so. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to uh, work with uh, with a quadratic trend. Uh, um, well, if you look at this, maybe you also even not following my derivations, you would have been happy because you can see the curvature. And you have accepted that there is a linear relation here. So oh, anyway, so can you? Uh, how can you imagine embedding that? What Frank just has presented in a in a bigger carbon cycle system, right? So so if you look at the uh, uh, if you look at the global carbon budget that I just that I just mentioned, whatever is not going down must stay up, and you assume some model for for emissions, and you get some uh, expression for sinks. And then you relate the whole, this would be like state equations in a state space model. And then you relate these unobserved processes to, to some data on concentrations and emissions and on things. Well, here you have to use model data. Then you could easily imagine to just throw in a bunch of equations that now uh, capture all these uh, sea ice measures and relate them all to this unobserved concentrations, atmospheric concentrations process with, with its own error processes, however you want to uh, uh, think about that, right? And then you could actually uh, uh, model the whole system uh, together with the atmospheric concentrations and emissions. And uh, for example, one could, could think about scenarios here where if you also, if you're willing to open this equation up here to macroeconomic data, uh, which you can easily do. You get very, very high um, coefficients of uh, 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 very high explanatory power here with, with macroeconomic data for emissions, because it's basically the exhaust valve of the macroeconomy. Uh, then you could uh, uh, create scenarios here for the CIs uh, values with that. Okay, and I think I'm going to end here. I have some few other questions, but this is more like uh, uh, detailed stuff, uh, uh, Frank, feel free to look at them and I hope you will find some of them useful. Uh, Frank, I know you need to run, but if you would like to take just a couple of minutes to respond, uh, feel free. Sure, sure. I know I know the time is tight, so I won't uh, be long, but um, thanks for those references, actually, the RELPAC reference and, and uh, the other one, Glor et al., we know of them, but somehow I think they slipped through the cracks. While you were talking, I checked to see if we cite Rafa like in, in the third paper and, and we don't. So that'll be very useful, um, you know, kind of solidifying the linearity of, of carbon trends um, from, a, from a mathematical viewpoint. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to say was, um, yeah, that was really interesting the way you showed um, the kind of nonlinear uh, time trend being obvious if you go all the way back to you know whenever um, pre-industrial times, but if you if you uh, go post 1959, less obvious. Um, but um, as you then pointed out, you know there, there's still a definite role for nonlinearity um, in, even in the satellite era for sure, which is all we're studying in our papers, which is like post 1979. Um, so anyway. Um, I just want to thank you. I, I can't wait to study those slides more carefully. I think they really uh, buttress a lot of the empirical sort of uh, findings that, that, that we've gotten. So thanks. Um, thank you, Frank and Eric. Um, so it's time now to move to the second talk. Um, Lars, if you'd like to share your slides. We can see that. Um, great. Excellent. So you have till eleven fifty. 
Okay, thank you. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a, it's a great chance for me to share some ideas. Uh, this is clearly kind of a research agenda as opposed to a single project, but I'm gonna talk about it, this, that um, kind of where we stand and, and, and in terms of some of our, some of our recent calculations. Um, so I have some important collaborators here, Mike Barnett, ASU, Buzz Brock um, at, at Wisconsin and Hong Zhang at, Ar at Argonne National Labs. So how should climate change uncertainty impact social value evaluation and policy? So, so in many respects, I think of this as, I think of Frank's work as stuff that down the uh, that, that, that we need to be thinking more about down the road. Uh, I'm going to be abstracting in some sense from, from, from some, some statistical questions today, but the approach I'm talking about is set up to uh, integrate in such considerations. On the other hand, we want to take it a step further. I mean, we we really want to go to the uh, uh, policy arena. Yeah, we uh, economists should be doing more than putting in SSP scenarios for climate science uh, uh, for climate change and, and and to do policy analysis. We're going to require some uh, fairly well structured economic models. And and here's and, and so that's that, that's going to be one of the important sources of uncertainty, which I'm going to be talking about here. But let me just start here with um. Let's see. Uh, I could make my own quote based on revealed preference, but let me kind of reference a recent paper. The economic consequence of many of the complex risks associated with climate change cannot, however, be currently quantified. These unquantified, poorly understood, and awfully deeply uncertain risks should be included in economic valuations and decision-making processes. Um, so this, this sounds like almost an impossible task, it's a challenging task, and and uh, and uh, and we're trying to go part way towards trying to address that. I'm very sympathetic to um, to this consideration. I think shunting uncertainty to, to the uh, um, uh, to the background when we're thinking about policy is a mistake, and and uh, and I think it's important to put it in the foreground and be really open about the nature about its nature and its impact. So in this paper, we're going to be considering. Particularly, uh, uh, three sources of, of uh, uncertainty. One's going to come from the carbon climate dynamics. This is the mapping of carbon emissions and the temperature changes. Another is going to come from the um, implied economic damage functions, reduction in output because of changes in atmospheric temperature, and technological innovation, um, future abatement costs for CO2 based energy through. Uh, uh, cost reductions for CO CO2 based energy through R&D investment. Okay. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to put all of these on the table simultaneously, and then we're going to start exploring this uh, kind of which ones we think have the strongest implications for climate policy. So in general, one can imagine these environments, we've got uncertainty coming from a whole bunch of different components and sources, uh, but they're not, some are much more relevant than others. And part of, part of the methods we're talking about are, again, are meant to help, help you isolate kind of which of the uncertainties that matter and which ones don't. And they can make you rethink problems, look for additional evidence they can re, uh, and, and help frame the uh, 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 even future research questions. Okay, so as Frank anticipated um, and, and, and perhaps in conflict with the session title here, I wanna push beyond um, risk. But I'm going to take a very narrow fo focus on risk. Often, when people think about risk, they don't really, um, but they they they, uh, that they probably think of it in more broad terms. But for me, I'm going to quantify in a way that I think is consistent with this formal decision theory: risk as um, uncertain outcomes with known probabilities. So whenever we write down a model um, with known parameters, uh, they're shocks. Then that gives us probabilities of, uh, of things we care about. Okay? I'm going to think of ambiguity as uncertainty over models. I got multiple models, unknown parameters, and the like, and the un uncertain unknown weights for alternative possible models. Okay. Um, now, this is something that statistics has certainly wrestled with. Uh, our uh, the way we're thinking about this is a little bit more from a robust Bayesian per uh, yet, um, yet perspective because we need some type of decision theoretic um, uh, end game here, but. Uh, but in the case of climate science, the, the subjective inputs into the, into the uncertainty, and, or, or climate economics, the, the, the subjective inputs into the uncertainty are really important. And, and they're not something that we, uh, and, and, and the results are potentially sensitive to what those are. And, and I think it carries over other, other problems too, like the study of pandemics and the like. You know, 
uh, at the outset of the uh, COVID, their you know, models kind of struggle because, because of the uh, idiosyncratic nature of the disease in which there's kind of uh, very unknown uh, uh, inputs and the like. Final. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We just want to make sure that you're not flicking the slides. We're still on the first title slide. Still on the first right? slide, really? Uh oh. Yes. So I, I'm doing to make sure that's intentional. Uh, it's not intentional at all. Let me try oh. again. Uh, it's a, on, on my screen, they're moving through. So, anyway, let me try again, a screen share again. Uh, let me try this. Okay. Yes, this work slide, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hopefully this will work better. Th yeah, 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 thanks for the uh, warning about that. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're going to be using control theory and decision theory to try to formalize these different concepts, uh, constructs of kind of risk, ambiguity, and, uh, and, 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 and say misspecification. And today I'm going to be focusing on the third one in, uh, in, in conjunction with the first one, although we've done other work, uh, and, and, and I'll talk a little, and I can talk a little bit about the second one. And the, uh, so. So let me start just in, uh, a little bit abstractly. We're going to be looking at continuous time models. Let me just start a little, a little bit abstractly about Brownian uncertainty, Brownian motion uncertainty. So let me just imagine I've got this underlying multivariate Brownian motion. Um, this is a state vector process X with, with, with a Markov structure to it. There'll be a decision process. I'm going to call it A. And then there's going to be a decision problem associated with that's going to be a so-called value function. I'm going to call it V hat where V hat of X is a, is a so-called continuation value. We're going to have, we're, 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 we're going to be thinking about this as a decision problem from the standpoint of a fictitious social planner trying to figure out what a prudent policy is. That then sets a benchmark for what ad hoc policies can achieve and what the gaps is but, uh, between those policies and what's, uh, and what's potentially possible. Now, the state vector process consists with this Brownian information structure is going to have a local mean increment. That's good thing. I'll just denote that, say, say mu of x of x, xt, and, got, and that which can depend on the uh, decision process, and a stochastic increment uh, that, 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 that there's a sigma x of x and a that kind of tell you how much you're going to weight the uh, Brownian increments. Okay. Now, we're, we're in the business of, of changing that model and saying it's misspecified. So we're going to borrow some well-known ideas from kind of continuous time mathematics, uh, and and in order to do that in a very uh, in a very tractable way, imagine H. H is just some process here, um, and, and what it's going to do is it's going to be the same dimension as the Brownian motion, and it's going to induce a change in probability measure. So so that the, uh, before the increment was this multivariate standard Brownian motion, under the change of measure. Um, uh, DW becomes a Brownian motion with drift, and this is this is kind of follows on, on, on the kind of Gersonoff theory of, of um, uh, associated with Brownian motions and martingales. Now, with this, we're, we're going to be using a criterion called relative entropy, which is basically uh, Kullback Leibler in, in, in this context. And, and, and the local contribution, because we're only changing drifts of Brownian motions or local means, uh, has this very simple structure to it. It's just going to be uh, you know, one half the uh, yeah, the norm squared of HT. So this is very special to Brownian motion, of course. You know, to to, to say normal distributions and and and, uh, and just changing means. So this H process can do can be very history dependent. It can do lots of things, but but uh, but locally, where uh, this Gersonoff theory leads us to think about the means. Okay, now. I'm going to spare you the full Hamilton Jacoby Bellman equations, but there's going to be an HJB or Hamilton Jacoby Bellman equation in which that local, in which the local mean of the increment of the, of the continuation values is, is, um, is going to be replaced by solving this problem. So this problem is going to take the kind of you know, the, uh, the usual Edo formula. You take the partial derivative of the value function, uh, multiply by the drift. But now what I've got is this additional drift coming into play, H. Okay. And that's going to be weighted by that, you know, that coefficient that that um, that multiplies h. Then there's the kind of usual trace of the um, second derivative term with a covariance matrix attached to it. Okay. Now I'm going to be doing a conservative adjustment here. This is all a theory of ambiguity or of uncertainty aversion, which means uh, you know, just like risk aversion, it's a theory of kind of you know, uh, that induces some caution. So I'm going to be minimizing. I'm going to put a penalization on that uh, local contribution to relative entropy. That's the CR H prime H or, or to the kind of kubeck leibler divergence measure. And I'm going to put a penalty parameter, C sub R, which we're going to have to talk more about going forward here. 
So what I'm going to do is in the, in the context of the decision problem, uh, recursively, I'm just going to replace the usual time, type of local evolution of continuation values with the solution to this problem. Now, jump uncertainty is going to also be important to us, and I'll kind of, kind of be explaining which you know, the, you know, the key places where it's going to be uh, in, in just a few minutes. But I, I want to think about um, the jump processes you want to specify in terms of two things. One is a state-dependent jump intensity, this kind of script I, and then a jump distribution. So let's suppose that jump distribution is discrete. Uh, um, and, and, and so it's going to, you know, pi of L given X tells you the uh, um, kind of the probabilities of jumping to these different locations um, conditioned on where you are today. Then if I now want to look at the continuation value, uh, drift increment. So what I want to again add to an HJB, what I would usually add to an HJB equation is a term like this. It's a jump intensity times continuation value or, or uh, where you are today relative to where you might be tomorrow. So if, if, if there's a jump to state L, uh, X is going to go to X tilde of L. And then I'll just integrate uh, th that over the various probabilities. Okay. So that's kind of, uh, that, that's, uh, that's just a usual specification of jumps. Okay. Now we want to look at a change in that distribution here. So, so kind of what we're going to do is, is, is we're going to use this function f. It's going to depend on both l and x, and it's going to change the jump distribution uh, in accordance to the following. It's, it's, it's going to f of l x times pi of l x, you know, that divided by the, the kind of mean over, uh, over, over overall x's will give me a new jump distribution. The denominator there is to scale it, so I, so, um, so I get a jump distribution coming out. And then, and then the f bar just gives me the jump intensity uh, to, to modification, multiplicative. Okay, so this f bar is just this kind of conditional average using the pi distribution. So what I'm doing is I'm simultaneously changing jump distributions and intensities. And, and in general, one can think about jump processes as almost having, as having state-dependent intensities in terms of where you jump to. So that it, it's not surprising you combine all this on a single function, L, F. And then the relative entropy, the counterpart to this kolbeck leibler divergence, um, in this case, you, you can work out. And, and I'm giving you the formula here. Uh, it's... <clears throat> So typical discrete time relative entropy has to do with densities time log densities. Well, because I'm changing, scaling the whole intensity here, then I get this additional term. So anyway, this is what sh this this is again a modification to the HJB equations, which which we want to solve. Okay. So to explore potential misspecification, we're going to replace this uh, this original term involving jumps and jump distributions with this minimization problem. Right? And again, I'm going to use this penalty parameter in order to penalize that, that uh, get, uh, get the looks for potential model misspecification. Okay, now with this penal penalization parameter, you know, if I make that really, really big, I'm going to just collapse back to the original problem with, with no concerns of, uh, of model misspecification. As I make it more modest, it's going to be uh, having the decision maker do more and more explorations of potential misspecification. So, so in the language of decision theory, this is like an uncertainty aversion parameter. Okay, now the decision problem, again, I'm going to spare you the details because I do, uh, uh, of all the mathematics, but basically... I've shown you how to modify a standard kind of decision problem in continuous time. Um, we're going to have a we're gonna have the decision maker play a recursive version of a max min game. The minimization is because you're going to look over these probability distortions subject to the penalization recursively, and then you're going to do solve a max problem because you're going to be maximizing all the over, over all the potential act, courses of action you can take or decisions. Now it turns out. There is an equivalent risk inversion, aversion interpretation of what we're doing, but we find it hard to interpret for our application. So everything I'm going to, the calculations I'm going to be talking about today could all be looked at from the guise of recursive utility risk aversion. But I, it, it's, it's, to, to me, these uncertainties are really important, and, and, and I want to think about these uh, uh, this using a different language and representations. Now, that drift distortion I gave you is just some general notion of a, of, of, of a mean shift in a normal distribution. There's a smooth ambiguity model, which we've, uh, which, which, which in continuous time I've uh, uh, developed with, 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 uh, with, with, um, with, with my co-author Miao, uh, that, that, that shows you how to do this. And it basically adds a structured way to, uh, uh, to the Brownian drift distortions. 
uh, and in fact, it's it's um, for the problems that I'm going to be looking at today. That wouldn't leave that wouldn't lead to very big differences, but for in in other problems, it could have very substantial differences. So this smooth ambiguity puts a lot more structure on things. And then and and, and then if, imagine that you've got some underlying set of of probabilities over different models, maybe based on historical evidence, because solving some filtering problem. Your, the smooth ambiguity model is going to have you now adjust that, and so it's and so, and so you make rut of adjustments of that of that, and then you'll have a, a corresponding um, rut of entropy penalty now, but but but, uh, but now over the kind of posterior di distributions coming into the current period. So so smooth ambiguity opens the door to doing interesting uh, dynamic learning models and the like. But as I say for today, I'm going to be uh, abstracting from it. Okay. Oops, let's see. Now. There's lots of discussions in, in, in scientific disciplines about so-called uncertainty quantification. Now, not, now we're going to do a twist on uncertainty uh, quantification and, and, and add on a decomposition. Okay. So one aspect of this decision problem is that we can figure out where the uncertainty is most consequential. So, so, so we're going to solve that minimization problem. That's going to tell us which parts of the uncertainty the decision maker really cares about, and 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 it's, and, and, and it's at the same time other parts that don't matter very much. Okay, now when we do this uncertainty quantification, well, well, there's still an important sensitivity to do. We don't view it our job as external researchers to tell society how uncertainty averse they should be. Uh, so therefore, we find it very useful to explore sensitivity in this parameter C sub R in this penalization parameter. Um, it, 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 and, and kind of show the differences here. And, and I'll be giving you some plots that kind of try to char uh, that characterize that. And then again, if you drive sigma sub r all the way to infinity, it's, it, it's, it, you know, it's like we're just using, um, we're, we're basically abstracting from the uh, misspecification concerns. Now we're gonna do one step further though. We're gonna also take those three channels I talked about, geoscientific, technological, and economic kind of uh, certain economic damages, and I can go back to that decision problem and say, well, suppose I load all the uncertainty on geoscientific concerns, or suppose I load, load all the uncertainty concer uh, concerns on, techno on technology, or suppose I load them all on the economics, on, on the economic part portions of it. How far does that get us to the uh, solutions to the planner problem in which all three are uh, uh, simultaneously activated? And in, in our calculations, it's, um, it's going to turn out that one of these you know, comes to dominate the other two. Uh, but but in general, I find those type of calculations interesting. So 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 these aren't the usual types of uncertainty quantifications people talk about. They take them one step further by using the decision problem to help really frame or 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 or, or say focus the decision problem, which I or, or sorry focus the uh, quantification, the uncertainty quantification, which I find very useful. Okay. So now I'm going to give you a very highly stylized model um, of, uh, uh, because. Um, and of the of the climate of the kind of climate economic system, um, you know this is a, this is a line of research where these so called kind of SSP scenarios are are kind of not very interesting because you know we're we're all about trying to analyze policy and trying to figure out what are prudent things to be doing, and and and, and to specifying exogenous paths and uh, is is kind of an interesting contrast to using scientific models as, as, as to 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 put on which they're fed through. So we're going to complete the story here. And, and, and we think for a variety of reasons, it's important to complete the story. Okay, so we're going to take a, 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 um, a highly stylized model of emissions. It's, it's going to, both, both the previous speaker and discussant talked about these approximate linear relationships. So one of the approximate linear relationships that's known is, a, is, a, is the link between the temperature anomaly and cumulative emissions. Okay? And, and, and that's been documented across a whole bunch of models and everything and, and, and the like. Um, and so we're going to take, we're going to strip things down there for now. Um, so we're going to imagine that the uh, 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 that, that the temperature evolves in this way. It's going to be kind of the, the temperature increments proportional to emissions. There's going to be a coefficient here that differs across the different climate models, and I'll be showing you a plot in just a minute. And then we're going to and then we're going to include a, 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 a little bit of Brownian noise that's multiplying by e sub t. So it's almost like a random coefficient model here at, uh, in the baseline. So it's so it's not literally proportional instant by instant. Yeah. Now, let me just show you a plot. Now, if you look at 
pulse experiments coming out of a bunch of climate models. Um, here, uh, here we're putting together uh, pulse experiments across 144 different model combinations. Some of them are models from emissions at temperature, some of them from temperature to, uh, to so, sorry, some are models from emissions to carbon in the atmosphere, and others are, are, are models from carbon in the atmosphere all the way to temperature. We're going to co combine all these and end up with 144 different combinations. Now, what I, I don't have a plot for here, but uh, uh, but 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 we've shown, uh, but but it's kind of well known. Uh, it coming out of the climate literature uh, is that if you look at the impulse response functions to pulse emissions, what happens is they is they basically uh, build up, peak in about ten years, and then from that point on, from an, uh, uh, go flat. Now, 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 when I talk about going flat, this is flat from the standpoint of an economist, since our time horizon. Uh, of our models, we have, uh, to, to, we're not willing to crank our models out for many centuries and the like, because 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 we feel we're lucky if we can get a few decades out of them. But 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 anyway, long term for an economist. Now now what I'm doing here is I'm taking those pulse experiments and I'm just forming some exponential weighted weighted um, average of the trajectories and showing you the climate sensitivity across models. So there's 144 different model combinations. This is that climate sensitivity parameter I talked about uh, uh, to just tabulate it, tabulate it across the various different models. So, so, um, um, so this is a model uncertainty. Um, Frank showed model uncertainty, you know, substantial model uncertainties in other contexts, uh, and, and, and this is what it shows up here. Um, okay, so we're going to take this as input into our analysis. Now, one possibility is we treat all models equally likely. Uh, so that that says you could translate this histogram into a probability distribution, but you know we're going to take that as maybe a baseline, but we don't want to like like just say that's the only that, that's the only way to weight these different models. And we so we want to explore what happens if you jiggle them around a little bit. Okay, so next we have this stochastic model of damages. Now economists' model of damages um, are. Are pretty ad hoc, and, and, and it's going to be an ad hoc flavor to ours. We're going to add some dynamics to it that, that that I think is interesting to put some important questions on the table. Now, now to advantage more focused research that the type of Frank's doing is you can open the hood on the damages, uh, uh, and, and that's important as, as we build richer model of damages. I've done other, I've got, got other ongoing researchers research studying the Amazon rainforest and spatial dynamic context, and again, there you kind of you get more. More specificity, more specificity to the nature of the damages. But here we're going to proceed as follows. Um, there's going to be a jump process. Okay, We're going to have damage uncertainty. There's going to be a jump process. And there's going to be intensity somewhere between 1.5 and 2. There's going, to be a, uh, uh, there's going to be a jump. Now, what this jump's going to do is it's going to, is, is this, is this going to reveal damage curvature. It turns out the damage, of, uh, the typical damage functions have pretty modest curvature up to about 1.5 degrees, and then and then there's going to be uncertainty what happens after that. So that uncertainty ex ante is is not known, but then but the, but then once we hit a threshold, the idea is we're going to learn it quickly. So that is once we start damaging the environment a lot more, we 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 will eventually figure this out with a, with with a, uh, potentially with a fair bit of accuracy. Um, so you know, this is this is kind of a metaphorical characterization of that type of phenomenon. Now that could occur at 1.5 degrees. It could occur at two degrees. We're going to keep or, or or somewhere in between. Um, we're going to capture that by a uh, by intensity function that uh, uh, moves up sharply between 1.5 and two degrees. Again, I think now we're about a 1.1 degree um, anomaly. So this tail curvature, it could be straight damages, but it could also pick up the fact that these, that these um, um, linear extrapolations of these climate models are uh, uh, you know, left out tipping point type behaviors, and they could also be folded into this. Uh, right. <laughs> but the dynamics here are going to be important to us here. Okay, so that's one of the that's one of the Poisson components. So here's just a plot of our uh, damage functions. Um, we're going to imagine up to 1.5. They're all going to track each other. This is a proportional reductions in economic output. Um, and but after 1.5, this curvatures uh, things may get more curved or they may stay very modest. So the upper envelope here of this of these curves basically traces out the original curve. The possibility now exists that things could, could be much worse than just simply extrapolating this modest damages. So like more Nordhaus's damage functions are have been off, you know often criticized as being way too modest. We want to, want to at least put on the table much more severe damages. Okay? And you know we could debate how 
um, how wide this range should be. But for us, uh, this is plotting the range range of damages, which is which would uh, which will play out. And then we have uncertainty about which one of these curves we're on. So after we cross the after after, we, after this plus one event gets realized, at that point in time, we know which curve we're on that, um, in, in, in in our calculations. Okay. Now, this could occur at 1.5. It could also occur at 2. So if it curves at 2, you will shift the starting date, and then, and, then, and, then, and then the curvature shows off further in the tail. Okay, so th this is the type of damage uncertainty which, which you put on the table. Um, so now let me add in a kind of stylized economic model in, into this in order to, to do the type of calculations we want to do. Um, one is there will be a, a, a stock of productive capital K. It's going to evolve as a kind of so-called eight uh, as a standard model with adjustment cost. Cap is the adjustment cost parameter, and it's going to be exposed to Brownian uncertainty. ITK here is the uh, new capital. We're, we're going to have a second stock that's going to be really important to us. It's going to be the stock of knowledge induced by R and D. Okay, and, and I'm denoting this J. So, so by R&D, but you know, yeah, by research and development. So we'll have this investment in research and development, and that's going to augment the stock of knowledge here. The idea is that this is targeted investment into learning more about productive green technologies. And, and, and um, that, that, that can, so we're going to make, you know, like, potentially stuff like nuclear fusion is a possibility that might happen. If it happens, it will have very dramatically good, good consequences. We have no idea. We're uncertain as to when that might take place. And the more we invest in it, though, the presum presumption is that we're going to increase the possibility of it happening. Um, so, I, so, so, so this is going to be a second form of investment here, and, 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 and this is our local, and this is our dynamic specification for that. Now, I've already, I've, I've already told you the third, the third state variable in our model was that was almost temperature, and you've seen those dynamics. Now it's going to be output, and this output constraint we're going to follow a stylized version of of, of, a, of, a, you know, of a type of specification that uh, the Nordhaus and others have used, which is a notion of abatement that takes place. So the output is split between consumption and the two types of investment. Okay. Now imagine for the starters there might be a fixed proportions technology where emissions and capital behave one for one. This is a technology then when you move away from the fixed proportions, then it, 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 um, there's uh, output reduction. And that's what's captured this type of functional form. And that output reduction is uh, um, uh, it's often called abatement. Okay. Uh, Okay, so so I'm just so, so the IT is kind of kind of this measure of a, the so-called measure is a so-called measure of abatement. We've got these different curvature parameters, and then um, what's going to happen here is there's going to be technological change, and we're going to make it dramatic at some point in time. Instead of a beta bar, beta bar would be kind of telling you this fixed proportion uh, uh, idealized point. At some point in time, that's going to get reduced dramatically, and, and, and we're going to literally set it to zero for purposes of illustration, which means that you no longer need. Um, emissions to produce output. So we're putting on the table the possibility of a technological change, and that's going to be, uh, uh, and that's going to be really critical to our calculations. And there's other ways one could do this in terms of the technology, but it's going to be proportional to that stock of knowledge. Okay, so we solved this model. We're going to add in all those robustness considerations. There's these jump components. The one jump is the realization of damage curvature. The other one is the realization of technology. We have to put all these things together. So consistent with recursive uh, you know, working backwards and backward induction, we, we start by computing a bunch of post-damage value functions and use those as inputs into, uh, in, into pre-damage specifications. Now there's different combinations. It could be damage, damage uncertainty gets realized for, or, or gets resolved first, or it could be technological uncertainty gets re, um, resolved first. So we have to do this in, 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 in various different combinations. And in fact, we have 20 different damage curves. So there's a lot of, um, of a, a lot of value functions which we have to compute in order to make all this to put together. And so what we have here is a bunch of coupled PDEs. It's not one PDE. It's, it's, it's best to be thought of as a bunch of coupled PDEs in, in, in which one set of PDEs are inputs into, into others, into another. And then, um, and, and so that's kind of at the background of this. I'm going to spare you of that, you know, more details on that. But there is a, but but that, but there is kind of an interesting structure to how we have, in terms of how we solve this model. Once we introduce these type of um, uh, 
jump components, components which I discussed. So now what I want to do is I want to look. You know, remember when we're solving that 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 um, that max min problem? Part of what comes out of that are shifts in probabilities or changes in probabilities, occur conservative adjustments in probabilities. At the same time, you're figuring prudent courses of action. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is is one of these kind of ten uh, it, 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 that comes out of calculation ten years out. The red histogram treats all it was it was it was ex ante baseline. It, it treated all models as equally likely, and then we've activated a, a type of um, uncertainty aversion or aversion to misspecification. That it's that this is of of a somewhat more modest type, and what you do is you you basically shift that distribution to the right. Okay, here. Um, here's a fairly modest shift, uh, um, and, 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 but, but, but these become important diagnostics. The numerical values of those, uh, of those penalization parameters can be hard to interpret. There are risk of aversion counterparts to it, which this modest one would probably uh, correspond, roughly speaking, to a recursive utility parameter of 20, but I don't, I don't find that interpretation very interesting in, in this setup. So um, now suppose that I go to more aversion society is more averse, then not surprisingly, you shift the distribution all the more to the right. Okay? Um, now, you know, pe you know, people often, often claim about max-min theory, oh, you just get pushed to the extremes. But this is max-min theory subject to constraints. And so we're, so what we're doing is moving probability distributions around, uh, but, but, not to, to, but not to extremal points. Okay? So that's the climate part that comes out of our calculations. Now, the technology jump part here, uh, here we've kind of taken the uh, intensity function and converted to um, probabilities. So the red line is kind of the baseline, uh, uh, computes these probabilities from the baseline intensity. Um, and, and we're kind of calling that neutrality. There's no concerns about misspecification there. The, the, uh, the less one kind of shifts you down substantially and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the more even further. Now, remember these, these probabilities are not what you believe, you're, 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 you're not determining beliefs endogenously. They're helping you support prudent courses of action here. And so this really says, in contrast to that shift of distributions we had for climate models, this is a big change here. We're, I mean, we're, uh, we're changing. Uh, uh, our fictitious planners really moving these, uh, um, these technology jump parameters down. And to be conservative, he's reducing it substantially. So the uh, these, uh, these green technologies un uh, yeah, under, under the sensitivity becomes much more much uh, much less likely than under the baseline. And now here's the damage jump probabilities. I, um, as I told you before, they're kind of, uh, they concentrate all the action between, between 25, uh, between, uh, sorry, 1.5 and two degrees. Now these scenarios I'm talking about, I should have explained this a little bit better. Um, or I should have explained it. We could do a whole bunch of stochastic simulations, and the model tells us how to do all this, and we'd have to think about how to do those in the most revealing way, because uh, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do them. They're straightforward. These are just simple trajectories simulated under the under, un, under the model solution and just closing down the uncertainty. That that is, even though you're concerned about this uncertainty, where it's supposed to move along a path under which there's uh, I, 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 those those things don't get activated. And so, um, and anyway, so that's what these are showing here. So these are one of you know, many type of uh, simulations one could do here, okay? Now there's these damage curve probabilities. Once you jump, once you do this damage jump, um, there's, uh, you're going to put weight on these different curves. So, so zero here just says you go with the most modest curvature. And and uh, three point I guess three point four here says that you go to the uh, much more extreme one. And there's twenty of these different boxes. We start off and making them all equally likely, and then not surprisingly, if the conservative justice is going to push you to the right here, it's going to shift probabilities to, to to the more you know bigger damages, and um, relative to the baseline. Now the way to think about these damages is formally what we're doing here is there proportional reductions in output. Uh, represented as exponentials of quadratics, and then there's this quadratic term that gets uh, gets, gets activated in a, in a in a more extreme way once you have the damage jump, and then this is just telling you how much more curvature you're getting. Now here's a less aversion. If you do more aversion, then of course you push that all the more. So so uh, so again, relative to the technology movements, these these look somewhat more modest. 
So the big concern so far is technology, the technology uncertainty. We're, uh, yes, yes, we're going to entertain technological progress, but we're, we're, we're really not very, uh, the thing we're worried about is the uh, um, how confident we are that, that that's going to be realized in a short period of time. Yeah. Now let me go forward with kind of actions here. Um, so here's the, so there is asset pricing in this, in this, in, the, in, the, in these calculations that, that are kind of diminished from the uh, point of this talk, but there's, but they're really at the heart of a lot of calculations. The social cost of carbon could be thought of as a, as an asset price under which you're, under which you're computing, you're looking at the adverse social consequences of emissions today over a whole future trajectory. And then, and, and then there's an issue about how you discount that and how um, and then how you make adjustments for uncertainty. Our planner problem produces counterparts to that social cost of carbon. And again, these uh, the, um, the, uh, the discounting and the and, and, and the probabilities use these worst case calculations, uh, which is consistent with the decentralization of ambiguity aversion models too. Another stock in here is um, is the, that social value of the R and D stock. And that's why I'm showing you here. So if you invest in R&D, it's going to have payoffs over you know, uh, future time periods in terms of uh, um, when the uh, new green technology might be realized. So it's kind of a, a social a social positive cash flow, and, 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 and that's actually, that then has the interpretation of an asset price. So, so, th so these are those in a log scale. Um, the, uh, the neutrality is a smaller one. And, uh, and, and then there's less less aversion and more aversion. And so since it's on a log scale, these look like pretty mo modest changes. So there's like you know 5.7 to to um to six going from the red line to the to the blue line. So it's a, a it's a <clears throat> that's a arguably small percentage change in that social cost in, in, in the social value. But that's but even that seemingly small change leads leads to a very big impact on the policy for for uh, R and D investment, and that's what I'm going to show here. There's kind of this magnification that shows up in our model here, the way that we've written the technological evolution. So so these are R and D investments over GDP, and if you look at the red line versus the green line, now we're talking about this 02 percent of GDP and ramp and and, and increasing by at least fifty percent. Uh, if you're more averse, even more so. So, so in terms of uncertainty consequences, th th this is the big deal. Uh, the, the, uh, the big deal, the, the way that we set up the model, is on the technology side. Um, yes, you like to uh, I, um, you like the prospects of a new green technology, but you're really uncertain. But you're really uncertain about its payoffs. That leads you actually to invest more, not less in it. Okay. Um, so now. To, um, to reinforce this, imagine that I closed down those different channels. I closed down, I, I, so, 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 so the red line focuses only on technology, the green only on damage, and, and, and the blue only on climate. Climate. You see that all the action here and the uncertainty adjustments uh, in, um, in terms of those paths are all coming from the technology aversion, not knowing the, de uh, not being fully confident in those technology probabilities. Okay. So finally, you know, here, um, here are the various emission scenarios. Um, that you know, you know, not surprisingly, you're going to reduce emissions uh, uh, um, as, um, as, as you get more averse. Now, you might be troubled by the fact these are increasing over time. So, so, so the way our planner works is 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 relative to current emissions that there's a big reduction in the uh, uh, in, in the emissions. These are trajectories going up because remember we've we've conditioned a path where there's uh, no jump realizations. So, so, um, uh, so, so you're kind of going along and, and then as you go along this path, you think it's more and more likely that those realizations are going to start happening. If I started computing simulated averages, these trajectories would be flat. So this is, this is very special to the kind of pathways which I chose, uh, to, to, um, to, to, to these increasing trajectories. Um, and so if you compare on certain channels though, in this case, even for emissions, you see technology is the big is the big deal. Climate uh, aversion and damage aversion are much smaller relative to this technology aversion. So it's a technology uncertainty that, that our planner is really most concerned about. Okay, so what do I take uh, take as messages from from our calculation? We think including endogenous R and D is really important tool for the planner. You shouldn't be talking about social cost of carbon without simultaneously talking about what's going to happen with R and D. 
the impact of technological uncertainty dominates those of climate and damage uncertainty right, in, in our calculations. Social R&D, the socially, uh, uh, is substantively more sensitive to uncertainty than emissions reductions. And where a planner might make major reductions in emissions, these paths of emissions might rise until they, there's a su successful technological advance. Now, the, the qualifications, of course, these are very special to our example economy. So, and so we think it's very interesting to you know, change different aspects of it. And there's different aspects of which, which we're um, um, in, in engaged in altering. One is our calculations are potentially sensitive to our big, uh, single big event. Here, this is a single big event, technological event that really makes um, this green technology a completely viable alternative and, and, and makes emissions unnecessary. Following previous literatures, our cost of abatement for emissions, which I, uh, turns out to be really low. You know, the amount of you, the amount of output lost by driving um, emissions all the way to zero on the production function is really, uh, uh, is really very tiny. We suspect that this contributes to the planner's willingness to immediately reduce emissions. Um, and, and we think that there, you know, there may be other dynamics that might emerge with with with, with abatement specifications that really, as you really start getting closer to zero, really really pull down the uh, uh, the productive capacity of the economy much more. Uh, so the so you know, these, you know, along these lines and others, we have specific plans for further sensitivity analysis. But let me just wrap it up here. Um, methodologically, we, we're working on providing a tractable framework to explore unknown challenges ahead in climate and economic outcomes. We do so by refining and extending methods from decision theory and asset pricing. Substantive, we explore policy ramifications of broadly conceived uncertainties with future geophysical, technological, and economic consequences. We show that it's important to include endogenous R&D investment into quantitative assessments of socially prudent courses of action, along with emissions reductions. And finally, um, the exposed limitations of a commonly proposed policy solution that entail a gradual decrease of emissions until a net zero, net zero target date. Uh, that may be a politically um, shrewd strategy, but it's, uh, pretty, um, it's pretty distant from the type of decision problems that we consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. You are, in fact, um, a little bit before the time, so I'll ask the question from the audience. So the question is, to what extent is the large impact of technology is an artifact of the stock where you model that jump? Oh, it's absolutely connected to that. And and and, and for us, that we, you know, we want to explore other possibilities. So, you know, like, like you know, for us, it's this like kind of big deal. It's like the uh, um, investing in the space race or, in, or, or investing in the atom bomb or something like that. It, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, you're making these social investments in, hope, in hopes of a very big breakthrough down the road. Um, we could easily imagine other forms of technological advance that could, could, that could proceed more smoothly and, per, and, and, and proceed in different ways. Uh, so we're, we're we're very open to kind of change uh, to exploring other specifications of technological change. Thanks. Um, so it's time to move to the discussant, Eric. Uh, um, if you'd like to share your slides. Oh, I, I, I stop mine. I hope. I, yes, I think you did. Um, I did. Yeah, Eric, would you like to share your slides? Yeah, yes. perfect. Yeah, we can see that. Okay. <clears throat> Good, thank you. Thank you for this invitation. I'm very happy to discuss Lars' work, as actually I did several times already, so pass on the topics. Um, so, um, okay. Uh, we have seen that uh, it is a great research agenda on uh, focused on uh, issues of uncertainty with the three main, main channels of climate sensitivity, economic damage function, and uh, which is kind of an important uh, contribution of the paper today, are in the investment. Okay. Um, so the, the contribution of this paper are with respect to the extent literature, uh, are in particular this uh, larger, this broader view of uncertainty, uh, defined not only through risk within the model, but also ambiguity across models and potential modeling specification. Uh, I should mention it is an important follow-up on two papers already published by Lars and co-authors. Uh, so, no. 
some extent, there is not much in the literature on uh, climate change to find with this so broad approach on uncertainty. Uh, but I will make a comparison in particular with the work Kyle Long that where they study the, the consequences of risk. Uh, so my, my, my discussion will be actually organized as with three set of questions, I would say. Risk aversion, ambiguity, uh, and uh, statistical influence by the, the social plan. Um, risk aversion first. Uh, you know, uh, last mention today is the equivalence between uh, the penalty parameter for misspecification and, and some measure of risk aversion. Uh, he also mentioned that's something I think I did not see in the paper I have read uh, is that in this context, he did not find much interpretation of this uh, risk aversion concept. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that he says that because to some extent, this is also something I'm seeing in my slide today. Uh, this risk aversion parameter seems to be questionable. Uh, first, there is a very general issue about externalizing model with these two parameters which are supposed to be disentangled. Is that there is kind of an impossibility theorem which has been put on the table by Duffy and Epstein, saying that the so called risk aversion parameter in externalizing cannot be a purely risk aversion parameter. It, it allows to compare risk aversion only for uh, plans which rank the same way deterministic program, meaning that the risk aversion parameter has still something in it about the so called risk aversion parameter, has still something in it about uh, choice between uh, different uh, time sequences, respective of uncertainty. Um, one way to, to think about it, I, I have considered a few years ago. With co authors, was to revise Epstein and Zinn by saying that, after all, we can think about it as maximizing expected utility with an external reference. So, uh, for people more familiar with that, it is very, very, very similar to the external habit forward by some, some co authors like uh, some of the authors like Campbell and Cook. If you think this way, you relate the so called risk aversion parameter of Epstein and Zinn with what we think to be maybe more relevant measure of risk aversion, we do not by X, because it is the guy, as I've just said, which is used to compare with the reference. You may, you may buy or not this, uh, this new interpretation, but irrespective of the specific interpretation, the point I make is that I am convinced that uh, the genuine risk aversion parameter is an increasing function of gamma, only when the elasticity of intertemporal substitution is smaller than one. Otherwise, it may be the other way around. Uh, it is something which has been partially confirmed by Lars and Goethe in their, in, their, in their chapter of um, psychometrics, where they note that it is um, only when sigma is smaller than one that we have a clear uh, contribution to risk cash. And also, Lars with uh, Ron Anderson and Tom Sargent. I put forward that by contrast with the risk aversion parameter, if it is a robustness parameter, uh, maybe it should be, it should be stable. Anyway, the point I want to make about risk aversion and the fact that Lars was saying that it's hard to interpret in this context is that if you believe that gamma in extended zine is a risk aversion parameter, you are led to the weird, in my opinion, weird conclusion that Karen Zek put forward is that it is only when the elasticity of interpretable substitution is less than one, that a higher gamma will imply a higher social cost of carbon. And it seems to me, I will be glad to know Lars' opinion about that. It seems to me that social cost of carbon should always be an increasing function of risk aversion. Uh, we have seen today, for instance, with Lars, that uh, uh, we are going to, to invest more in R&D when there is more risk aversion. Uh, this should be monotonous. Meaning that it may pave the way to interpret the parameter A I was putting forward instead of the epsilon in parameter. That is to say, out of the special case of CCAPM, uh, it may be misleading to think about this gamma and epsilon as a risk aversion parameter. So hopefully, this confirms last start about the interpretation of the risk aversion. Just to Short point about the most uh, common practice of risk adjusting discount rate. Uh, 
Last in his paper is of course right to say that discounting should depend on the exposure of the cash flow uh, being discounted to aggregate risk, which is a way to promote a stochastic discount factor instead of uh, just risk adjusted discount rate. I just want to mention that it may be possible to bring to bridge a gap between the two approaches by doing as Martin Desman has proposed a few years ago to uh, think about different components in the, in the payoff is counted at different rates. Um, my second set of questions is about ambiguity uh, because it has been said from my, Martin Desman also, and uh, I think it's quite clear that in this context, ambiguity, ambiguity matters more than risk. Okay? Uh, you know, typically you have left tail for, uh, for the, the possible uh, climate damage. Um, you know, climate risk, uh, you know, uh, it is even more tricky than asset pricing because you have already a few time series of past observations. So when you know that asset pricing has put forward disaster risk, a rare event, to some extent, it is even more difficult to get information about. And, you know, Following this logic, Martin Fussman has proposed what he calls the discount theorem, saying that if you think that consumption is not normal, as soon as you put some uncertainty on sigma, on the variance, okay, irrespective of whether you try to use a prior or to use some temporal counterpart, you are going to, use your, to replace your log normality by your log student. The problem with student is that we know that the moment generative function is infinite, you know that we end up with a stochastic discount factor, which is infinite, which is of course very disturbing. And this is the reason why I'm saying that ambiguity is more important than risk. Uh, to some extent, I follow the remark by John Newicki some years ago, is that for an econometrician between a, a normal and a student with a large, no, many degree of freedom, there is not much difference to observe. But in terms of decision and uncertainty, it is much different because the student is putting the expectation of the stochastic discount factor to infinity. So obviously, it is, it, it is not appropriate. And it is much, I think, efficient to think about the log normal as a baseline and to think about uh, uncertainty around as, as ambiguity. Okay, so it seems to me that ambiguity is really relevant. Okay, last set of questions statistical inference by social planner. You know, Lars has promoted uh, many times in, in his research, in particular in his Nobel lecture, that we could see uh, economic agents as themselves econometricians. So in his Nobel lecture was entitled uncertainty outside and inside economic models. And if I apply what I believe I have understood from Lars logic to the social planner problem, okay, the social pro problem is an econometrician. Uh, but then, I'm not fully sure to follow uh, Lars on some, on some points. That is to say, number one, uh, it seems to me that uh, the social planner may accept global misspecification. You know, basically, in the paper today, we have kind of local misspecification, that is like not too far in entropy terms. But it seems to me that as an econometrician, sometimes you don't care that you are far from the truth, as long as you can make a clever use of the pseudo true value of the parameter you are, you are estimating. Uh, you know, and in many cases, you know, it is not by some of course, for, for uh, Gosham, so good like you would for Garch, but there are many, many examples like that. The pseudo true value may coincide with the true value, or may at least be interpretable. And so I'm not sure to be. Fully, maybe I would say there is room for further research to introduce global misification in, a, in the aversion for, of the social planner. My second point about uh, social planner as econometrician is about identification of key parameters. That is to say, last put forward, and of course is right, the importance to have a stochastic discount factor to properly price the, the risk in the, in the payoffs. Uh, this stochastic factor is fine. The question is that, is it so clear that we can identify the key parameters which have given rise to this stochastic discount factor? It seems to me that it depends on available data and it depends on purpose. Available data first. 
Let me give an asset pricing example. When you read the, the empirical version of Epstein-Lenzin work, they, they, they note that if you just observe the market portfolio, basically you can hardly identify the difference between uh, separable intertemporal expected utility uh, and the more general recursive utility. It takes all the assets to identify the difference. So yeah, it seems to me that I may wonder whether it is also the case when we are working on social cost of carbon. Uh, is it clear that we can, what are the, what, which is the nature of the observation we have and what parameters can we identify? And it seems to me that it was so dependent on the purpose this identification issue. If you think about the, for instance, the equity premium puzzle, it is known that it's a set pricing literature that people have tried to explain the equity premium puzzle with many additional features like ambiguity version, disaster risk, dependent parameters, and so on and so on. But actually, you can capture the observed equity premium if you allow the risk aversion parameter in the, in the utility function to be very high. And people are shocked by that because they say we know by experiment that risk aversion for investors is not so high. Fair enough. But when we are talking about a social planner, it seems to me that we don't really care about the preferences of the social planner. We are using the social planner as a tool to, to, to build uh, relevant uh, stochastic discount factor. So to some extent, I'm not sure that we are so bothered by unrealistic large values of risk aversion. <laughs> Just also a sort of about ambiguity aversion, which has been used to, to explain the equity premium puzzle. Maybe we don't have really the same puzzle when we think about a, a social plan. Okay. Uh, to conclude, uh, just mentioned as a kind of uh, joke that Lars has been very nice with me some years ago by discussing a paper of mine. This is Lars' quotation about, about my paper. So, <laughs> of course, I want to, and even more importantly, to, to say that for, for this paper today, of course, there is a lot of uh, important uh, research avenues. Uh, and, you know, to some extent, it is a follow up on. Uh, uh, Long research agenda that Lars has put forward, he has contributed a lot on the distortion, on the version, robust transform, and so on. And I'm been glad to see that recently, this, these tools that he has developed for maybe 30, almost 30 years now are very illuminating to understand how to work with climate risk. Thanks, Eric, for the discussion. We'll give five minutes for Lars to respond, uh, if you'd like, Lars. Sure, glad to respond. Um, as always, Eric leaves the uh, author with uh, with about ten or fifteen different things to think about, so I I, I won't be able to respond to all of these. <laughs> I will. I'll, I'll, I'll give a terse response to some of them. Um, one is that on the ambiguity, um, and, and and the same would carry over to misspecification too. I think a misspecification as putting an unstructured set of models on the table and ambiguity is adding structure to them. And, and in the diffusion context, because of absolute co continuity constraints and this, and, the, and, the, and this fiction, you can figure out volatilities fairly easily. It, it leads you to, um, to uh, focus on mean distortions. But uh, there is a decision theory in continuous time by, uh, by Pung and others that, have, uh, uh, that, 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 uh, that kind of get you out of that, that straight jacket and are worthwhile thinking. Now, now I view the Gavicki Weitzman work is a pure risk work, and it's and it's saying, look, you know, if we're we're very cl clever people, we can make utility functions minus infinity if you want by playing around with distributions. And I say, okay, great, you can do that, but but the real challenge is, are these really the ones that we ought to be concerned about? Um, you know, you know, once you make you uh, the utility functions minus infinity, I'm not sure what you do anymore. Maybe you don't get up in the morning, or I'm not quite sure what the exact conclusion is. But it, to me, that just says you better think carefully about uh, uh, the, you know, this family of alternative structured models and make sure that the ones you put on the table are are indeed the ones you really care about. Um, the other issue that 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 was inter that, that that's worthwhile thinking about. You know, our paper's a normative paper about we which, uh, we give preferences to a social planner and proceed. But the question is, um, where's the positive aspect to it? So, 
an important extension of our analysis is to kind of have a more positive view of both a planner and in the private sector, and and then to and then to see what the, what implications get revealed. Now, arguably, the planner ought to be representing private sector perspectives on some of these issues, and so that so so that still remains that that still becomes an interesting question about trying to identify uh, uh, parameters from say more market data. So I think that's useful. We, we're obviously, that's not where we're at now, but I think that's potentially useful to think about. And finally, social externalities, um, they're very interesting, but you gotta, but you gotta take them out for a spin. But if, you, if, you, if you take Campbell Cochran out for a spin, you get some very perverse macroeconomic implications you know, coming out of it. And, and in general, these kind of reference-based utility functions, I, th I think they can be very interesting, but let's, you know, I, I, I want to see them apply to a lot of applied macro context to make sure we're not going to get some, some somewhat strange applications out of them. I'm not, I don't want to rule out social externalities, nor, uh, nor do I want to rule out reference utility, but, but, but I also want to make sure we uh, use them with our eyes open. With that, as I say, Eric gave me a phenomenal number of things to think about. It's a very thoughtful discussion, and it's uh, and it's highly appreciated. Thank you for the time and effort. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Lars. Um, well, thanks again to uh, both speakers, Frank and Lars, and uh, both discussants, both Eric's. Um, I will just um, end with one brief um, announcement that mm -hmm. for the rest of this um, academic year. Till next fall, we don't have any SOFI seminars. Uh, we do have in a couple of months uh, our 15th annual SOFI conference, which will be in Seoul. Um, and um, we, uh, the, the dates are June 16th to 18th with a pre-conference the day before, June 15th. So we do hope to see as many of you um, as possible there. Other than that, we will continue next fall. So if you are not subscribed to our mailing list, please do so. That's how you get um, notifications for the upcoming events. Right, with that, thanks again for all the participants and the audience who joined us, and we can stop the recording now. Thank you.